Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar tonight titled, Why Was I Referred to a Neuropsychologist? This webinar is brought to you by a wonderful collaboration between itsyourepilepsy.com, the Epilepsy Foundation, Eastern Pennsylvania, Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado and Wyoming, Epilepsy Foundation of Los Angeles, Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota, the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Alliance, the Chelsea Hutchison Foundation, and the Mexican chapter of the International League Against Epilepsy. My name is Rena Lachlan, and I'm the program director for the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania, and I will be your host this evening. Tonight, Dr. Bradley Folly will be sharing his knowledge with us. During his presentation, your videos are not shown and you are muted. Please write your questions in the chat box and I will present them to Dr. Folly after his presentation. The recording of this presentation will be shared with you sometime within the next few days. Dr. Folly is a clinical neuropsychologist practicing at the Norton Neuroscience Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. He earned his PhD at Vanderbilt University and completed his internship at UCLA, followed by two fellowships, one in neuroimaging genetics and one in epilepsy and movement disorders. He has been practicing since 2009, primarily working with individuals undergoing neurosurgical therapies for seizure and movement disorders. His passion and the role that he brings to the patients and providers with whom he works with is understanding how the brain processes information and how to use that information to optimize neurosurgical therapies for individuals living with those challenges. So welcome, Dr. Folly. Thanks for being with us. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you and also Dixie Medical for sponsoring this because this is a nice way uh, for those of us who work with the epilepsy community uh, to uh, reach out beyond just our uh, clinical observations and clinical meetings uh, and to get together in an informative way and actually be a community. I was going to start just, just so you know a little bit of who I am. Rena gave me such a nice introduction. Um, but uh, right now, I'm, I'm originally from upstate New York, and I'm practicing now in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, after having gone through my training. And I really do have a passion for what we call functional uh, neuroanatomy, figuring out what the brain does and how we can use that to help individuals who need to understand what their brain does in order to make their lives better and to help with epilepsy movement disorders and, and things like brain tumors and things like that. So that was a brief introduction. Um, you know, tonight's talk was about what is a neuropsychologist? Why am I being referred to this person? Who is this person? Um, it seems like when you put neuro in front of anything, it, it sounds pretty fancy. So you're sent to a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, a neuropsychologist, all of these neurospecialists. We are, neuropsychologists are uh, experts in how the brain works. And we're not physicians, we're doctoral level psychologists who have gone on to complete um, training, clinical training in uh, how the brain works and how it works in certain disorders and how we can use that information to go on and help people. And that involves doctoral education after college, clinical internship, postdoctoral fellowships, licensure. And then um, we also go, go on to get board certification, those of us who choose to, uh, where we're tested by the people who wrote the textbooks to say, hey, do you really know what you're doing for this specialty? Um, and that's a good thing to look for in a neuropsychologist when you refer to people, somebody who um, you know has the background and, and, and the knowledge to go through this and work with these populations. So what is a neuropsychologist? Again, when you put neuro in front of something, um, it, it's, it seems to take on a new life of its own. But psycho all psychologists have a doctorate in the field. And I'm a clinical psychologist with a specialty in neuropsychology, clinical psychologists work with individuals on um, how to help what we call abnormal behavior. So things that are going on, things that are wrong, things that people want to be fixed. And that can include therapy, but it can also include complex diagnosis. It can also include some of the things I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight. And so when you specialize in what I do, you become a cl clinical neuropsychologist, uh, which is how we ask, how do underlying brain circuits and functions contribute to the behaviors or emotions we're seeing? And how can we use that information to help individuals who are getting treatments, whether medical or surgical treatments, for things like epilepsy? So 
we describe how the brain works uh, in an individual patient. So a lot of the research we have comes from individual patients and also groups of people uh, who have some underlying brain dysfunction. And we use this information. I'm going to talk about this in a bit, how we derive this information. But we take this information and use it for an individual patient. So the questions I ask and the questions I'm consulted for uh, by physicians and, and, and for patients include things like, how does the individual brain process information? How does one person's brain take in visual information and verbal information? How does that person's brain process it? Where are those things processed? What are the processing strengths and weaknesses? We all have them. Um, and I have tools that I can use in my office, we'll get into that, on how to reveal what those strengths and weaknesses are. Sometimes we can also figure out, are those strengths and weaknesses due to a medicine, due to dysfunction in an area of the brain, due to secondary emotional uh, factors and things like that. So we rely on patterns. Patterns in what you do, when you come to see a neuropsychologist, you'll be asked to do things. You'll be asked to remember things, learn things, pay attention to things, solve problems. And we look at that after you leave the office um, and we ask, what are the patterns that we see over and over again in this individual's profile? Are those caused by underlying brain dysfunction? Are those caused by emotional interference? Are those caused by something else? What can we say about the individual and how can we use those things to help the individual uh, get better, uh, whether that's through different medical therapy, through surgical therapy, or even education and understanding how somebody might want to change the way they process information. So the story goes back a long time, and there's a history between epilepsy and neurosurgery and neuropsychology that's existed for a very long time. As a matter of fact, Epilepsy, the, the individuals with epilepsy have taught us more about the brain than really any other group in, in the history of, of medicine and neurology. And there are certainly some individuals who are even very well known, almost everyone knows who they are. But I'm gonna go back and talk to you a little bit about how we even found out this information because for a long time, if you tracked back the first epilepsy surgery, um, you could talk, that could go back into the Neolithic times, 3,000 years, um, uh, you know, before the Common Era. The first real epilepsy surgery that we knew about was from about the mid-1800s uh, in England. But really, the field didn't advance until uh, the 20th century. And through all of this, the first thing we had, you know, we still don't really know. We know that the brain is involved with our thoughts and emotions. It's not the heart, it's not the liver, right? So the brain somehow produces our thoughts and our emotions and things like that. But we really don't actually know directly how. And um, what we've come to learn is a great deal about what parts of the brain work together to do those things. And I'm gonna go back a little bit because the first, the first notion we had about any of this is that we looked at people who had brain lesions. So, individuals who had naturally occurring lesions um, from something striking them in the head from a stroke or something like that. And we could kind of look at, well, what can they do and what can't they do? And the first thing we learned is what we call dissociations. When we evaluated or examined individuals who had single lesions, you could, we call that a single dissociation. So if somebody has a lesion, in a certain area of their brain and they can't talk, for instance. We know that that area of the brain disrupted that function, but if they can still read, it didn't disrupt that function. So all we know is that the area with the lesion uh, is involved some way in talking. Some people have multiple brain lesions, right? So when you have a, somebody who has a, a brain lesion in one place and another brain lesion in another place, then you can actually say, well, this brain lesion caused this problem and the other brain lesion caused a totally separate problem. So in that way, you can say area X is involved with one function and area Y is involved with another function. And they didn't seem to, um, the, the problems in one didn't appear in the problems in the other. And then 
you can see over here, you know, a single dissociation is speech production. We call that Broca's area in the brain. Um, when there's a lesion here, people have difficulty expressing with their words and, and, and out loud expressing their thoughts. And when you have two lesions, a lesion in Broca's area, but then another one in what we call Wernicke's area, people have difficulty with the input of language and understanding. And so from that, we learned that this area in the front of the brain is involved in production of speech, but not in comprehension. And the area back here is involved in comprehension, but not, not, not necessarily production of speech. And so at the beginning, when we were trying to figure out how does the brain work, that's all we had kind of before we had the tools that we have today. And you may have seen these maps and, you know, in the popular literature, people talk about this, that you're right brained or you're left brained and or you're creative and you're artistic. That really oversimplifies. I mean, we in my field oversimplify things quite a bit. That oversimplifies it to a great degree. And it's not that your left brain does math and your right brain draws pictures. That's that's not how the brain works. As a matter of fact, the whole brain uh, metabolically uses a lot of energy and uh, it wouldn't exist if just parts of your brain weren't, weren't doing things because it uses a lot of energy. Your whole brain is processing information all the time, but certain areas take a greater role in processing certain information than others. And so what we've learned now is that the brain functions in network. So we don't say anymore just this area or just that area. We also now know that the white matter of the brain, the gray matter is kind of on the outside of that. Those are the little computers that do all the processing. The white matter, which you can see here in this in these blue bundle, this blue bundle here, connects the computers. These are the internet wires, the ethernet cables. And we can now look at the brain in terms of networks and function rather than just looking at it in static areas because of the technology that we have and build models like you can see over here about how the brain is connected in function. Um, and it's very complex. And um, we need to understand these things for individuals who have neurologic disorders to understand what's working and what's not working. One of the best examples of this is the neural circuitry of language. So we used to just think this area is responsible for talking, and this area is responsible for understanding what other people say, but it's way more complex than that. And since those early areas, we now understand how these areas are connected and how they work together for such a complex behavior such as language to see what we see in an individual patient. So getting back to epilepsy, epilepsy is dynamically involved. So individuals with epilepsy and their care partners, their family members and their friends, uh, often get uh, introduced to many, many different people, primarily the neurologists. Epilepsy is primarily um, a medical disorder that requires neurologic intervention. And through that, as the complexity or needs change, uh, individuals may meet uh, neurosurgeons or neuropsychologists like me. Um, community support groups and advocates, ARENA is a great example of that, mental health professionals. There are a lot of uh, individual spokes in the wheel and epilepsy individuals have to kind of be familiar with, with all of that and they come to know all of us. So again, we have a shared and intimate history. My field learned a lot from epilepsy. I'm gonna tell you uh, a, a few cases about that. Um, surgical treatments, and I'm not gonna talk just about surgery today, but surgical treatments for epilepsy have taught us a great deal about invaluable options to treat epilepsy. Um, so we learn from patients who had early surgeries what to do, what not to do, and how those parts of the brain work. They've also contributed more about our understanding of the brain than any other neurologic condition. And when the surgical treatments are performed well, the results can be life-changing nowadays, right? So now that we have the tools to figure all of this out from what we've learned, it can help individuals in, in numerous ways. It's invaluable. So we have patient care, greater understanding, and leading to better treatments. I'm going to start with this guy who was a neurosurgeon at the University of Rochester. Um, Dr. Van Wegman in the 1930s, uh, you know, patients with really intractable epilepsy, meaning epilepsy that wouldn't respond to treatments, um, would go to neurosurgeons, and neurosurgeons wanted to help these people. They didn't know exactly know how, but they would take bits and pieces of information that they may have gleaned from their own other patients 
and kind of try to use that to say, how can I help this individual patient? And I'm gonna to talk to you today about a part of the brain called the corpus callosum, which is kind of where he devised his therapy that he tried on patients. So the brain has you know, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. It's divided into these two main lobes. And those are connected by these fibers. Remember the white matter, the ethernet cables that go through the brain. And these cables, uh, supply information. Now we have cables that go within a hemisphere. So they go from the front to the back or the back to the front or from the brain down to the spinal cord. But we also have fibers that cross the brain and they cross, most of those crossings happen in the corpus callosum, which connects the fibers going from the left to the right hemisphere. So if an individual has epilepsy, partial epilepsy that starts on one side of the brain, it can actually hitch a ride on these cables and go to the other side of the brain and then end up at the other side of the brain. And, you know, information is also transferred through these the halves of the brain and these, the left and the right hemisphere connect to each other and cause our experience um, that, that we go through every day. What Van Wegenen uh, noticed is that there were, he happened to have some epilepsy patients who had brain tumors in this area. Uh, of the brain and the corpus callosum. And as the tumors grew, because they also had epilepsy, their seizure frequency decreased. Okay, so it's an observation thinking, hmm, why did their seizures decrease when this, when, you know, a pathology in this part of the brain seemed to get worse? Two epilepsy patients with a different, had blood vessel lesions in the corpus callosum, so a different kind of lesion in the corpus callosum. And those lesions appeared to stop the seizures altogether. So he's kind of thinking, gosh, how can we use this information to help individuals with, with epilepsy? And that started this procedure that we now call the corpus callosotomy that's used more in children today because their, their brains are still growing. In adults, it has, uh, you know, once our brains are set in adults, there are some unwanted side effects. And it's certainly now used very sparingly, usually for um, uh, individuals, younger, younger patients who have these drop attacks um, and who really need something uh, major to help them, where those fibers are, are severed or cut, and it allows seizures at least starting in one hemisphere to not travel to the other hemisphere. But it was through these, uh, you know, initial observations of this guy who we developed this therapy for it. And we also started to understand through what, what, what behavior those patients displayed. Uh, you know, individuals can have certain problems with after surgery, not being able to talk for a couple of days. And uh, these things called disconnection syndromes where one hand isn't able to um, communicate with, with, the, with the other hand, knowing what each, each hand is doing. We were able to, able to observe how the different hemispheres of the brain uh, communicate with each other. And I'm gonna talk about this in more detail. So um, 10 patients with epilepsy in May, 1939, um, underwent this procedure and section of the pathways, this is from his own work, may be carried out without any untoward effect on the patient. Such a section may serve to limit the spread of an epileptic wave to the opposite hemisphere. And what's, when such limitation occurs, the patients do not seem to lose consciousness nor have generalized convulsions. A lot of this came out of the history of um, surgery for psychiatric disorders. And what people were looking at were gross behaviors, right? So making sure the person could breathe and speak and do all these things. They weren't looking at kind of the minor behaviors that we look at today. So after giving the patients a series of brief tests of what I, what I kind of do today, back then, they weren't as in depth. Uh, the first individual who did this reported that most of the patients had the same level of cognitive functioning after surgery and displayed no behavioral or personality changes. And so you kind of have to ask yourself, wow, I mean, that part of the brain was cut through and you're telling me there were no effects at all. And uh, two guys, uh, Michael Gazaniga and Roger Sperry at Caltech said, but in order to know that, you have to give these cognitive tests to each half of the brain separately, really. So how do you do that? How do you give these cognitive tests to each half of the brain separately, right? And so we're going to talk about laterality. So we have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. 
And in most individuals, the left hemisphere is what we call our dominant hemisphere. It does most of the stuff that we think of interacting with a human being, talking and, and um, understanding, reading, a lot of linguistic-based things. Um, and the other hemisphere tends to take in the whole, it sees the forest, not the trees. It takes in the whole idea, it puts things together, it gives emotional context to what we're doing. Um, and so you can actually use the visual system. And I, if you look closely at this, I'm gonna, we're gonna walk through this together. The visual system is set up where information from the left visual field, that means stuff that you see on the left side, if you're looking straight ahead, the left visual field is on the left side, winds up all going in the end to the back of the right hemisphere of the brain. And things in the right visual field, so stuff that you see on the right side, winds up going back to the left hemisphere of the brain in the occipital cortex back here. But both eyes, if you divide the eyes in half, your left eye and your right eye, both eyes see both visual fields. So if you close one eye, you can see stuff over here and stuff over here. Each eye, the stuff that it sees on the same side as the eye, so the right eye, when it sees the right visual field, right, those fibers wind up crossing the other side of the eye, the, eye, the side that's furthest over, stays on the same side, and it sees the opposite side of space. And so in the end, if you can flash something very, very quickly, remember our eyes are always moving, and it's about 200 milliseconds, 180 milliseconds. So if you have somebody look straight ahead and you flash something to the right and to the left, and you don't give them a chance to move their eyes so they can look directly at it, you can present information just to the right hemisphere of the brain or just to the left hemisphere of the brain. And there used to be a tool called a tachistoscope where people would uh, you know, put their chin on it on a chin rest and they'd have it set up with a slide projector and this, this timer. And we don't have to do that now, we can use computers. But if you flash these things very quickly, it'll go to one side of the brain or to the other side of the brain. And so they used this to do this information, to present information to one side of the brain of, or the other. So another famous patient, William Jenkins, had a post-traumatic epilepsy, epilepsy from uh, a, tra a military um, uh, trauma to the brain. He was a veteran from World War II. Um, his seizures became uncontrollable, and the medications at the time, which weren't as good as what we had now, no longer helped him. And they sent him to Dr. Bogan, um, in Cal this was in Los Angeles, and said, can you, can you do anything for this guy? And he, he said, well, I knew about this Van Wegenen thing, and I, I'm going to perform the corpus callosotomy. And it did help him. They became less severe and less frequent. It helped the patient. But they sent him over to um, Dr. Sperry and Gazzaniga. Uh, and Sperry later won the Nobel Prize for this major finding because it was a major insight into how we understand how the brain functions. And I'm going to walk through this. This is conf this is, can be confusing. And we're going to walk through it together. But remember, the corpus callosum that connects these hemispheres okay, of the brain was cut. So you're not communicating between the two hemispheres, but you're presenting information. They presented information to the left visual field and the right visual field using that quick, rapid response where the individual is looking right at the center and they present something to either the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere. And the information can't cross to the other side, okay? So the visual information can, because it doesn't go through the corpus callosum. But when the hemispheres try to talk to each other, they can't. Um, and remember the arms, still could communicate with that hemisphere of the brain because the information goes up the arm. It crosses over in the spinal cord. So if you look at your right hand, it crosses in the spinal cord and goes up to the left hemisphere. Again, not affected by the corpus callosum. So if you present the word face, so language, verbal information, to the right side, right? It goes into the left hemisphere. And in this individual, the left hemisphere was dominant for language. And so they can say, tell us what you saw. 
And the individual will say, I saw face. I saw that word. I was able to read it very quickly. It's a short word. Okay, that's not surprising. Great. What if we show you, what if we flash that to the right hemisphere? Okay. The right hemisphere doesn't have that type of linguistic component in it, right? So they would flash it to the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere couldn't send it to the left hemisphere to tag it with language. So the person, when they asked, what did you see? The person couldn't say, I saw face, because it, it was non-linguistic at that point. But what the person could do was draw a face using their left hand, because the right hemisphere is connected to the left hand through the spinal cord. It's not affected by the corpus callosum. So the person drew a face, they just couldn't say face. And it was this fundamental understanding of the brain that was groundbreaking, honestly, because we tested both hemispheres of the brain separately. Um, and this is using this, I do this information from this is what I use all day. Uh, this understanding of the brain is still used. So they wondered, how do these individuals experience a cohesive reality, right? So if our brains are constantly communicating and they're sharing information with each other, but these individuals can't necessarily share that information with each other. How do they make sense of the world? And so what they did as a further experiment, the next level experiment, is instead of the word face, they presented, they flashed these pictures to either hemisphere of the brain, okay? So in this example, you've got a snowy scene over here on the left. Remember, that goes to the right hemisphere. Um, it ends up in the right hemisphere, so it's non-linguistic, it's a scene. And here's kind of a, a chicken foot, and that go, winds up going to the left hemisphere, which in this individual and most individuals has the linguistic component, the language. And they ask them to point to the pictures to go with the mess images you saw. So at the bottom, there were eight other pictures, and the and the the individual, the participant, the patient's job was to point to things that went with those things that he saw. So he said, he pointed to the picture of a chicken head and a picture of a snow shovel. Now we understand why he chose the picture of the chicken head, because you saw a chicken foot. So the chicken head, okay. Now it makes sense also, of course, the snow shovel. It's a snowy scene with a house and a snowman and a car. And so they thought he was gonna say, and then I saw the snowy scene and you need a shovel to clean the snow. But guess what? That's not what he said. It's very interesting. We manufacture our sense of reality and it really shows you how we create the reality that we experience as individuals. And he said, oh, that's simple. The chicken claw goes with the chicken and we know we'd say that. And you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. So unbeknownst to him, he got the idea of a shovel from the snowy scene, but created the reality, that left side of the brain that spoke right, and, and responded to those questions, took the information it received from the environment and drew a connection between them. And that's really what we all do every day as we receive information, as we process information. And this gave us a really good look at what those hemispheres of the brain do. The next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is this guy, HM. When I was in school, he was just known as HM. There was privacy, we didn't know his name. Everyone just called him HM. Um, and as a matter of fact, I was, I lived in, I went, did my fellowship in Connecticut. Uh, and at the time he was living there and I had no idea he was living just right down the road uh, in a nursing home. Um, but we now know he's passed away, he passed away in 2008. His name was Henry Molason. And uh, again, he gave us an individual with epilepsy, um, gave us a greater understanding of the brain that we use today for our surgical uh, in information and for non-surgical information. He taught us a lot. So Henry suffered from epilepsy and there are books written about him. You can read a lot about him and the ages and the dates sometimes don't match up, but he was very young and apparently had a bicycle accident. He hit his head. And by the time he was 27, he was really unable to work. He did some factory work. He was on an assembly line and he couldn't really couldn't even do that work. And they went to this guy, Dr. Scoville, who was at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut. And um, he said, well, you know, you know, they didn't have the workup that we have today. So at the time they thought his seizures were coming from his 
his hippocampi, his temporal lobes. Other people have looked at this today and said, we actually think this guy had uh, frontal lobe epilepsy. There's, there's some indication of that. But at the time, they thought he had temporal lobe epilepsy. So they thought, let's remove the hippocampi in both sides of his brain. And they knew that there was probably going to be a memory deficit. There were some other researchers at the Montreal Neurologic Institute who had looked at patients with lesions in that area of the brain, and they knew that it could cause a memory deficit. But at the time, they didn't really know where memory was in the brain. And no one really knew that there were different kinds of memory, right? So there, when someone comes to my office and talks about their memory, and most patients are concerned about their memory, when they talk about memory, to me, memory is like 20 different things. Memory for what you did yesterday, memory for the future, memory for how to ride a bike, memory for knowing when you learned what the capital of Italy is. All these things are different kinds of memory, and they're actually stored in different places in the brain. We know that um, what these parts of the brain in the hippocampus down here, where Henry had this removed, and I'll show you a map, are really important for what we call experienced events, episodic memories. Things that happen at a time and a place, that part of the brain seems to want to put together time and place, like a flashbulb, a memory where you can picture where you were at a certain time and experience. That part of the brain seems to process and consolidate, make permanent those kinds of memories. And we didn't know that at the time. We do now because of this. So they decided that it would be a good idea to try to remove the left and right, we do not do this anymore. This is a, a big deal. We learned from this man that if you remove both of these, you'll never be able to form new episodic memories. You won't be able to, you know, tomorrow, remember what you had for dinner today, where you went. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this story. He had both of these removed, thinking that it would stop his seizures, and it helped him for a while, but it didn't wind up stopping his seizures again. It, it seems like maybe he didn't really have temporal lobe epilepsy. They were just trying to help him. But he had severe anterograde grade amnesia, meaning amnesia for new things. He couldn't remember new learning. So it was kind of like if you sit and talk to him and then leave for 10 minutes and come back in the room, he wouldn't remember having talked to you, right? So he could remember things from a long time ago, things that he learned when his hippocampi were functioning normally. He could... He stored that stuff and he learned that stuff. So they, there was a temporal gradient in his memory. Things from a long time ago, and some reports say up to 11 years before the surgery had difficulty remembering. But things from a really long time ago, he remembered. And they tested him for, at the time, famous faces and to see if he knew who celebrities were and stuff. He really couldn't learn new information. And so um, he wound up living the rest of his life kind of in care in a facility, and it allowed him. Uh, to help out with science, uh, and that wound up paying for his care, a lot of it, and a lot of work was done with him. He was a very friendly kind of man he was described to be, um, and what we learned is that even though he couldn't remember having seen someone the day before, um, they did an experiment with him, and uh, let me follow you through this. So this is a skill learning task. So they asked him to trace this star every day, so they went in, every day and ask him to trace this star. So you, what you have to do is you have to put your pencil down and trace in between the lines. But guess what? You have to do it in a mirror image. So you can't look directly at it. You can only see what you're doing from the mirror. And what they noticed is every day he got better. So it took him fewer and fewer attempts to complete it. But if they asked him, well, do you remember doing this yesterday? He said, no, I don't remember doing this at all. But clearly, his brain was getting better at it. This is that idea of a double dissociation, right? So we knew his hippocampi, obviously, and the surrounding tissue. It's not just the hippocampi, but that tissue was responsible for recent memory, episodic memory, binding you know, a place and a time and having that photographic thing, that episode in your mind. But that's not the part of the brain that's responsible for skill learning. There's a different part of the brain, uh, the basal ganglia further up in the frontal lobes that seem to be more responsible for this thing. So that allowed us to learn, well, wait a minute. Now we kind of know what the corpus callosum does. Now we know what the mesial temporal lobes, the hippocampi do, and they don't do this. We're starting to learn about the brain. And neuropsychology 
kind of grew out of this to say, well, how can we use this information to help people? We learned those, the anatomical basis. Episodic memories have context and they're processed by the hippocampi, the mesial temporal lobes. Implicit memories, remembering how to do things, skills, are not processed there. And so that was a, another fundamental uh, lesson that he taught us. And we use that today because when individuals are going in for temporal lobe epilepsy uh, surgery, which is the most common form of uh, partial seizures, we remove only the right or left hippocampus because we know our job is to find the one that's really helping you do your day-to-day -day memory and leaving that one. And we can't remove both because if we remove both, you're going to have memory problems afterwards. A lot of individuals with epilepsy develop memory problems because these areas of the brain are involved in their seizures and over time they become affected by that. There are also other parts of the brain that help the mesial temporal lobes put down those memories. And sometimes it's not the mesial temporal lobes where the problem is, it's some other areas of the brain. And we have to do my analysis to kind of figure out where that is. We also use this information and some of you out there may have had or are wondering about the WADA procedure. Some of you may have had it and some are, may have been told you this is a procedure coming up. It was named after someone who actually just passed away this year, um, Yun Wada, who is a, a, a Japanese neurologist who came to the Montreal Neurologic Institute and worked with some of these guys who'd done the early work um, and wondered, you know, in order to figure out how not to hurt someone after surgery by taking away their ability to talk or the ability to remember, how can we do like a mini surgery, something that's reversible? And that's what the WADA is. We can introduce um, a catheter into a large vessel in the leg and feed it up. Uh, usually a, a neurosurgeon or a radiologist will feed that up. And we can inject a little bit of an anesthetic agent. And that gives us about five to 10 minutes to figure out what that half of the brain does before we go on to the other half of the brain. And what we're primarily involved in is wondering, would surgery on this part of the brain or this half of the brain affect the individual's ability to remember or to speak or to understand? Because those are the things that kind of nobody would want to hurt a person that much. We wouldn't want to sacrifice, you know, we wouldn't want someone to have freedom from seizures, despite how wonderful that would be, and not be able not be able to talk or remember or something like that. So this is an essential part of the epilepsy workup in many centers. We also do as neuropsych, and by the way, this is neuro, the neuropsychologist does this uh, the testing of the behavior while the that catheter is being introduced. We also do, and a part of my practice, an extensive part of my practice, is using functional MRI. Because remember, we know that it's not about just areas of your brain. It's about how does the brain work together? And functional MRI is a great tool. It uses the same MRI machine that, that everyone uh, knows and loves or hates, <laughs> more importantly. But this time, you don't um, just sit and, and kind of close your eyes on the scanner. What you do is you have to do tasks. So they may ask you to read things or to come up with names or to do things like that. And we can look at regions of blood flow um, in your brain and where those things uh, tend to increase metabolism in the brain. So we can use these features as well to um, investigate the brain and to look at people and to uh, non-invasively, by the way, this doesn't involve any injections or anything like that. You go into the scanner, you do the stuff, and we use intrinsic properties based on the uh, oxygenation of your blood to figure out during tasks what part of your brain are more active or less active. And so we use this to figure out what, what half of your brain is language primarily in. Um, it's important for people who have dyslexia who might have a language on both sides of their brain or not in the areas where we think it is. Um, we can plan surgery around this. And certainly it's important for people who undergo invasive monitoring, um, people who uh, need to have electrodes placed on their brain to figure out where their seizures are going through. Um, this will give us a map beforehand to know kind of what area we're getting into for that. So how can all of this help with epilepsy? Um, understanding the cause of the, the symptoms that you report, which undoubtedly most of my you know, days are, are, my memory's bad, my memory is horrible. Um, and we kind of have to break that down and figure out if they mean word finding or you know, uh, what kind of memory they're talking about. 
uh, neurologists will give EEG data. And you know, we now have ways of figuring out where people's seizures are coming from, and we're much better at that. And the, you know, the neurologist will send me an individual. Here's where the seizures are coming from. This is what they're reporting. Is it because of the seizures or from something else? Understanding long-term progression. Is the patient's memory getting worse? So sometimes we see patients or individuals over and over again. Um, individual might say, you know, now I think I'm really, my memory is horrible. Well, now we can provide objective data. And I'll get into what those data look like, but we can provide objective data to see if it really is getting worse or if there's something else going on. We can also talk to the patient. Remember, as neuropsychologists, we're also clinical psychologists. So we understand the psychological elements that are affecting the quality of life of individuals. And this is, can't be understated. I mean, individuals with epilepsy, their families, their friends have a, a burden of, um, there's, the day is a lot more difficult because a lot of more things have to be coordinated. Um, transportation, breaks at work. There's a lot of things that, that come about that can cause stress and that can, honestly, that can cause difficulty with resource management of, of the cognitive skills that you have. You're worrying about things that a lot of people, uh, other people don't have to. Referrals from neurology. So some, some people are referred to me by neurologists. Some are referred to me by neurosurgeons in my practice. Um, and it could be that the, that the individual goes to the neurologist for their checkup and how are your, you know, how's your medication doing? How's the Keppra doing for you? And they say, you know, I'm, I'm noticing that more and more often I have difficulty concentrating. I have, uh, you know, I feel sluggish. My memory's bad. I have trouble coming up with words. I, faces are familiar to me, but I can't remember the person's name. And, um, you know, the, the neurologist will say, hey, well, we're going to send you over to the neuropsychologist to figure out what that's coming from. What's the cause and what can we do to help? And then someone like me will see you in the office, uh, kind of figure that out to the best of my ability, and then consult with the neurologist and say, here's what I think is going on. Referrals from neurosurgery often deal with questions like appropriateness for surgery. Um, do individuals have the emotional and social support to go through with this? Do they have any other problems that need to be treated prior to surgery so that we can treat that on the front end rather than the back end? Assessing cognitive adequacy versus reserve. Again, we all have stuff that we're good at and we all have stuff that we're not so good at. We need to make sure uh, before we talk about surgical intervention that there's adequate function to allow normal day-to-day -day tasks and that the parts of the brain that are available to the individual to, to use to process information are adequate to do that. Um, that's very important and it can't be understated enough because nobody wants to hurt an individual. And hurting could be a surgical hurting, somebody bleeding, infection, things like that. It could also be removing a cognitive function that they really need. And that's where we come in for that. There's also a lot of uh, analysis of underlying neural circuitry. When, you, when epilepsy surgery is planned, um, it, we ex discuss extensively what functions does that tissue, the tissue that's planned for surgery, what does it serve? Um, you know, would the patient have a deficit if the planned brain tissue is removed? Those kinds of things. So we're involved in that surgical workup of an individual as well. So here's the part that you all may be asking, and maybe you wanted to know, what am I, what am I in for? You're going to get this letter that says you've been referred to this neuropsychologist and you should plan on being there for four, six, eight hours. Uh, and you've never had a, an appointment like that. Um, and you might get nervous and they might use words like tests. You're going to have tests. I, I actually hate that um, because it's terrible to tell someone you're going to be tested for, <laughs> for eight hours. Um, uh, you know, uh, bring up, bring somebody, well, why do I have to bring someone? What are they going to do this whole time? So typically you'll spend a good part of the day in the office um, with, uh, with me, someone like me, and typically somebody else uh, we call the psychometrist. And those are individuals who uh, are trained in very specifically administering these neuropsychological not tests, but tasks of ability that we want you to perform. And what's crazy about this, I'm going to show you some examples. I can't show you the actual tests because they're they're shrouded in secrecy. I promise I won't we won't show you um, ink blots or anything like that. but once once we show people things, they can use it to prepare, you know they'll know the answer and we need to know it's from your brain and not from just 
the preparation you do. So I'll show you some examples, but typically what you do is you meet with the neuropsychologist for an hour before or after, and they go through your history. You know, how long have you had epilepsy? You know, where'd you go to school? Uh, tell me about your emotional life. Are you depressed? What's going on in your life? Where do you work? What kind of job do you have? What kind of other medical conditions do you have? And that's why sometimes it's really important to bring someone who's seen your seizures. So, you know, an individual with epilepsy may not be aware that they're having seizures and certainly won't be able to say, well, this is what happens during my seizure. Again, it's important for the neuropsychologist to hear that because, um, you know, if, if the informant says, you know, they stop talking and then when the seizure is over, uh, they're very, they're, their speech is weird and they say weird things. That's a good sign that seizures are, are affecting the dominant hemisphere of the brain. So it's really important uh, for someone to come in who's seen your seizures and, and help remember those things, report about those. So you'll, you, you and the family member or friend will speak with the neuropsychologist, do that interview. It usually lasts about an hour. And then the rest of your time is in formal cognitive assessment. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. You can take breaks. Um, you can bring a snack. You can do things. It's not, it's not the most fun you'll have. But what you're trying to do is, in order for us to see how your brain works, we need to have your brain work. We need your brain to work. Um, and we need to, to, to watch it. We need to watch what things are easy for you. And we need to watch you maybe get frustrated to see what things are hard for you. Um, uh, but effort is important. And as long as you show us what you can do and can't do, we can actually look at your brain and say, these are the things that it does and these are the things it doesn't do. So we're going to select measures of cognitive ability. That's kind of my job is to say, let's let's throw this at the person. Let's throw that at the person. Let's see if they can remember words. Let's see if they can learn complex designs. Let's see if they can judge where lines are in space or, or solve complex problems uh, where, where they have to match visual detail, things like that. What we do is we use these measures and they've secretly to you have been given to thousands of people, some of them, some of them hundreds of people previously who don't have these uh, medical conditions. And we kind of learn what the human brain is supposed to do. What are these individuals, where do they perform on this? These people who are in the normative sample, we call it. And then what we can do is compare what the individual patient does to the normative sample. Um, so what I what we do when you're there is we spend all day collecting data. And then what I do, my homework is to sit down with that over time. And it takes, a, takes many hours to look at that and try to figure out what parts of the brain are working well, which aren't working well, and could that be due to seizures, medication, depression, what's going on? And so what are these cognitive measures, right? What are they? A lot of them are paper and pencil measures of performance. Um, you'll sit at a desk with someone and, and, and they'll ask you to draw something or they'll ask you to, you know, to copy some things. Uh, problem solving, memory, attention. Uh, nowadays, we use computers, right? So you might have to you don't have to know a lot about computers, but they might present something on a screen and you might have to hit a space bar, or hit a button to respond to something. Filling out questionnaires, long inventories, where you might be asked the same question four times and wonder, why did I even sign up for this thing? Um, but if you go in and just do, it, do what you're being asked to do, there, there will be benefit on the other side of that. Um, the, the neuropsychologist might actually uh, check some of your reflexes or motor skills, put some things in your hands and ask you if you can identify that. Um, your vision, figure out, you know, if you can see things on, bo on both sides. Putting these results together after you leave, it gives a comprehensive view of your brain. But again, they're only as good as the effort you put into it. Um, and a lot of people just don't want to be there. And so what we'll do often is reschedule and say, hey, you know, it's not worth it for you to be here for six hours. Let's, let's get you back when you're feeling better. So what are these tools, not tests? We don't want people to kind of think they're being tested. But you know, that you might be asked to take something like down here. And I might give you four blocks um, that are half red and half white and ask you to put them together uh, to form something. Or I might, might say to you, here's a design with a missing piece. And I want you to pick the one from down here that would fit up here to complete the pattern. Those are two examples of spatial things. Here's a test of planning. Might give you a maze and say, I want you to start here and end here. You can't cross any lines. You can't pick up your pencil. If you make a mistake, just backtrack. And there's going to be someone there with a, stop, a stopwatch 
timing you and it might seem like oh i gotta get this done really quickly it just it is what it is we just want to see how long it takes you and how you process getting from one part to the other and what you do when you encounter a problem we need to see what you do how you update that information so you might solve problems someone might read you a story and ask you to remember it later or a list of words copy a drawing read words out loud name pictures define words estimate plan all those kinds of things are done in a very specific way and that's the important part of what the psychometrist does because they have to give these tests or tools in a very specific way in order for the normative data to apply so remember we've previously given these tools to lots and lots of people hundreds to thousands of people and so we kind of know where people should be so if we graph it out the majority of people their ability level is in here right the, way, the vast majority of people are in here as your ability level drops to here or goes above here we know that there's something exceptional about what you're doing either on the good side or the not so good side everyone has stuff that appears here and appears here right so we know what their strengths and their weaknesses what we try to do is look at the things you know, we tend to look at the things on this side of the graph, the things that are weaker, because again, we're looking for stuff that's not working as well because we're dealing with people's complaints, individual symptom complaints. Um, it's like blood work. It tells us how your organs are functioning, except this is specific to networks in your brain. So common patterns that we see uh, when I look at patterns, the temporal lobes, if people have problems there, problems with language, memory retention, visual processing. In the frontal lobes, uh, people have personality changes, difficulty with organization, planning. Um, the frontal lobes are actually involved in every single action that we export and, and, and uh, organizing the brain. The parietal lobes, these green things, are involved in sensation and awareness. We can look at the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. The front of the brain, which exports everything, the back of the brain, which takes everything in, vision and sensation and what you feel and hear, um, all that stuff. And we can kind of come up with this map of your brain and figure out what's working and what's not working. Um, and I want to leave, I see that we have a few minutes, I want to leave a time for any questions or anything that people may have given us uh, in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to spend spend time with that. But I wanted to thank everyone. I hope this wasn't, I hope no one fell asleep. Um, and uh, if you have anything, uh, please let me know and, and I'd be happy to answer it if I can. Thank you, Dr. Folly. We do have some questions for you. So the first question is, um, are patients that are referred to neuropsych primarily those affected by intractable seizures? And how can neuropsych help students? Sure, yeah. So there are really two questions there. Um, I'll, the first one is, um, the answer is no. Um, we, we see everyone, not necessarily with intractable seizures. So intractable essentially means that you know standard medical therapy isn't helping them. And so kind of they need a higher level of care. And sometimes that means stronger medicine or surgery, um, at least an opinion about surgery. And so certainly we can see those individuals, but it doesn't have to be at that. A lot of uh, individuals with epilepsy I see are simply on standard you know medicine and they're noticing that they have certain problems, their memory, their concentration, and we can be invaluable in those things as well. Different people respond differently to, to different medications. And also, as people get older, um, stuff happens, and, and we can opine about what's going on uh, with that if it's due to epilepsy, medication, or age. So certainly, it's not just useful for intractable epilepsy, especially if, that, if that's coming from a, a provider who's referring. You shouldn't feel bad referring for anything you know, non-intractable, anything that can help the patient and the family with education or help with medical therapy or things like that is certainly within the realm. The second question is about how can uh, neuropsychology help students? And that's a great question. I get this all the time because a lot of, there are two sides of that. One is the disability side. So a lot of, of individuals who um, have epilepsy, who are students who are in that age of their lives, find that, you know, epilepsy, the Epilepsy can be a disability, but the therapy can also be a disability, right? So epilepsy itself comes with problems, but sometimes the medicine you're put on to stop your seizures or help control them 
can also be disabling. It's causing word finding problems, um, or it's causing fatigue or exhaustion, or it's causing personality change. You know, we can we can rattle off the names of those medicines that are that are the the offenders mostly, but a lot of uh, individuals will come to us and need accommodations, and so um, it's kind of tricky with insurance and stuff because. Really, to see us, it has to be for you know for a medical reason in terms of treating your epilepsy. And treat, but talk to your neurologist because they can um, word that in such a way where we can see you uh, for that reason. But it will also educate you and possibly provide some communication with the disability office at school on how to help you and make accommodations. Um, but it doesn't even have to go that far. You know, a lot of this is useful just for education of the self. If a student is wondering, and I see we see this a lot, right? A lot of times people put stumbling blocks ahead of themselves, right? So I see, you know, somebody who I'm dead set on being an architect, let's say, but really, let's say that the epilepsy is causing problems with visual spatial skills and planning of complex visual information, but they have really good verbal skills. And, and you kind of think to yourself, gosh, this person would be a wonderful lawyer. Um, and you know, you can continue in architecture, but you should just know that. That's not the thing your brain is naturally going to be strong at. And you, you may want to apply to law school or something like that. So, and I'm being a little bit funny about that, but but the fact of the matter is, is it can educate individuals about what their strengths and weaknesses are so that they don't have to put another stumbling block in front of themselves and they can kind of use the good things that they have uh, to, to continue in their life trajectory. Hey, wonderful. Thank you. Um, another question here, can the neurosurgeon perform surgery with, without the neuropsychological evaluation? Well, I'll get myself in trouble with neurosurgeons, but um, uh, certainly, you know, an individual patient, let's, an individual with, with epilepsy, I, I hate using the word patient, but an individual with epilepsy and their physician or their surgeon can decide in partnership how they want to deal with or treat or not treat the problems that they present with, right? So I'm a strong believer that that partnership is sacred and that partnership um, is a partnership of trust and those people can decide what they wanna do with each other. I would certainly say from my perspective that um, it's best in the best interest of the patient, of the individual with epilepsy, to really go through the characterization that I can provide using the tools that I have, whether it's outpatient assessment using those pen, pencil and paper tools or fMRI or the WADA test or whatever it is, to really characterize the brain because once we take something out, we can't put it back in, right? And so if we're going in for a resective therapy, which is only one example, and nowadays we have other therapies, there's responsive neurostimulation and, and deep brain stimulation. So putting stimulators in parts of the brain um, but what I would suggest is if you're working with a surgeon uh, who's kind of said, oh, you don't need that, just talk to them about kind of what their, you know, what their rationale is, because maybe there are factors um, specific to, to your individual case where it seems like things are, are pretty uh, pat and dry and they know a lot about it, maybe from other things. But just talk to people about their rationale. I found that I find that like a lot of individuals go in, they're scared to talk to their doctors. Um, and you really have to just just understand everybody's rationale for things and under educate each other about what you want to do. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, do you evaluate patients for dementia? Yes. Um, and that's kind of I really didn't talk about that because this is really an epilepsy specific talk, but a lot of neuropsychologists specialize in dementia, and certainly I have a lot of experience in that. The way this comes about with epilepsy is very interesting, and I actually just saw somebody, I just had a feedback session with somebody um, who's 75 years old uh, and has had epilepsy their entire lives and has been treated with Dilantin for 40 plus years plus other medications, and is now at the point in their life where they're asking I'm having memory problems, right? What's that from? And so the, the, the hypotheses that I have to test are things like, okay, is it from your brain? Is it from epilepsy in your brain? Is it from 
dementia, you know, now, and dementia is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a grab bag because dementia is a word that means you cannot, you, your cognitive functions aren't strong enough to support your day-to-day -day activities, but it's caused by one to 200 different things. The most common one is Alzheimer's disease. And at a certain age, even individuals with epilepsy think, is this causing Alzheimer's disease? You know, it, there's a lot of anxiety about this stuff. And so what we can do is check to see if you have a pattern that looks like Alzheimer's disease, uh, or check to see if this looks like it's from epilepsy, epilepsy plus medication, epilepsy plus age. Uh, you know, some, sometimes people have subclinical seizures, so it doesn't look like you're having a seizure, but really there, there are little discharges going off in your brain. So um, an epilepsy neuropsychologist certainly would also be sensitive to the factors that um, involve uh, dementia and certain forms of dementia and can certainly look for patterns that would disassociate the two or show that you might have one, one or the other. Okay, thank you. All right, another question here. Is the neuropsychologist going to evaluate my memory after surgery? It's a great question. And at our center, what I do um, is see people beforehand. And the bad thing is that that first time they come in, they don't know what they're in, <laughs> they don't know what they're in for. And so they're there and they complete, they complete everything. And what I like to do is see individuals six months to a year after surgery, uh, unless after surgery, they report something. So if they say, you know, this just seems bad and it's not getting better. You know, we certainly want to see that patient as soon as possible. But everyone who has surgery, yes, I want to see them six months to a year out. Um, the problem is a lot of pe people don't show up. <laughs> so um, they think, well, gosh, I don't really want to go back there and spend eight hours of my day. And so we'll have to, to track a lot of people down and beg them to come back in and, and say, you know, we really need to make sure that we're doing the best thing for you and that we can compare post to pre. So my answer is yes. Um, and I certainly think that's an essential part of the comprehensive uh, uh, epilepsy surgical workup. Okay, wonderful. All right, last question here. Um, what are the most common tests perform performed before surgery? Yes, so um, it's a great question because what we want to do is build hypotheses, right? So I've got a cabinet out there with lots of tests. I can, you know, pull tests out, test for this, test for that. Be before I see a patient, I do my homework. I usually do it the night before. And um, I look at their EEG, I look at their MRI, uh, look at, read their neurology notes, see what other therapies they've had before, see where their seizures are coming from, see what therapy they're being suggested to do. Is it, is it RNS? Is it a resection? Is it DBS? What is it? a different medication, and I'll build hypotheses. And I'll say, you know, for this individual, it looks like their seizures are coming from the temporal lobe. So I want to test memory really a lot. I want to test visual memory and verbal memory in different contexts and look to see how you learn and how you retain information. But I'll also say, you know what, let's see how their frontal lobe is contributing to that. And let's see how the function in their parietal lobes is allowing them to be aware of these things. So what I'll do is I'll build a battery, we call it a battery, of assessment tools, pretty specific to that patient. And we'll add in things. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll add in things once we see the patient, um, and I'll tell the psychometrist, here, here are the things I'd like you to give. Um, and then they, they come in and give me feedback, you know, during those several hours. You know, this wasn't really good, or that's good, or I'm concerned about this. And I'll say, hey, try this, try that. So it's an iterative process. It's a back and forth process that should be based on clinical hypotheses, based on what, what's going on in that patient and what question you're trying to answer. And in a neurosurgical question, uh, that mostly is, can we take out a part of the person's brain? Where, where are the strengths and weaknesses? And you have to build a specific set of tools in order to do that. So uh, what's good for one person isn't necessarily what's good for another person. And so it's very important to work with a neuropsychologist who does that, um, who kind of builds that, because in that way, it can be most sensitive and most informative. 
Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and for all the great work that you do with the epilepsy community. We appreciate it. You thank too. you everyone for tuning in tonight and um, I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you again, Dr. Folly. Thanks everyone. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks.